Come on, Wayne. I'm not going to use the nickname when you use the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but a while back, and uh, Wayne won a great award, and it's a short resolution. But it says to recognize and honor Wayne Southern Inspector of the Chesterfield uh, School Bus Shop and to congratulate him on being named the 2019 national winner as America's best school bus inspector. Whereas it is the district pride that the members of the House and the representatives have learned about Wayne was named the 2019 American Best School Bus Inspector at the 16th annual event sponsored by the National Association of Pupil Transportation held in Cypress, Texas from December 16th through the 8th. And um, as shop foreman, Wayne serves the Office of Student Transportation in the South Carolina Department of Education in the Chesterfield County School Bus Shop. And whereas the dedication and commitment of Mr. Southern has provided students the highest level of safety and efficiency possible cannot be overvalued, and whereas the South Carolina House of Representatives is deeply grateful for the standard of excellence set by Wayne in order to carry out his duties to inspect the school buses that carry our young students to and from the daily school activities in Chesterfield County. And on behalf of the South Carolina House of Representatives and the school board, we're very proud of you, and thank you for what you've done for our students in Chesterfield. Congratulations. I'd just like to make the comment that when I moved to Chesterfield County, I was told by someone before I came, Chesterfield County had the bus, best bus shop in the state. And I can tell you as someone who has dealt with people transportation all over the state, there's no doubt that the commitment that y'all have at our bus shop, that's true. Uh, it's amazing what y'all do for our kids every day, and we do appreciate it very much. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. In your, your package today are the June and July financial reports. Of course, of course there, there are some approvals that will have to happen in June, so that, that information is not you know, fully closed out for the year. And then we also have the July report uh, just opening the year. 
Uh, if there are any questions, I will try to answer them. And if there are not that there are and that I cannot answer, I'll get you to the answer. That's all on the financial. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, members of the board, board. Uh, at, at this time, time I'd like to recommend the following exhibits for your approval. Exhibits A through G. So I move. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote. All those votes have motion to say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> Folsom. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. I have a few things that I'd like to highlight from your June and July curriculum report. Chesterfield County is again partnering with Clemson University to begin our fourth cohort for reading recovery in this district. We are excited to announce that we are having a second training class, so we are able to train up to 24 teachers in the area of reading recovery. Um, Mr. Mike Moss has come back from Clemson to help us with that second class, and we will be putting our own teacher leader, a second teacher leader, in to work with the second class after she goes or he goes through training next year. We also concluded our Camp Accelerate this year, our district served students in 4K through 12th grade. We had guidance counselors, nurses, media specialists that all worked with our students. We provided bus transportation for our students throughout the district. They were immersed in reading, writing, and researching all day. Elementary and middle school received approximately 15 read alouds that they could add to their home libraries. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, Ms. Wilson, uh, I'm looking at you say K through 12 through high school. Is this the first time we have one on like a full scale like this? Yes, sir. Well, I can remember that in our government in the beginning that these makeups of lost time and the first of the libraries. Yes, sir. Well, well done. Any All of the Chromebooks are in our schools at this time. Once students are back with us, we will um, be distributing those to our students and it will go in our one-to-one um, -one system so that we can keep up with who has which Chromebook. So they will be issued? Yes, sir. Good, good, good. All right, that's what I wanted to know. I guess the next question is, is whether we're gonna be able to technology serve them throughout the county. Yes, sir. Uh, obviously, we, we have the uh, technology instructional specialist on staff now. They came on, obviously, during this fiscal year. They've already done some training. Of course, we provided the online training opportunities for our teachers uh, that also count as recertification. Uh, we have a goal to do a mock uh, e-learning day in the uh, month of October. That gives us September to kind of get our feet on the ground. We'll try to do a mock e-learning day. You do that at school so that the teacher can help the student with the idea that we can um, be prepared to use up to, uh, we can use up to five e-learning days in the year, um, you know, in cases like in inclement weather or if we are dealing with COVID. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Paul. Thank you. Moving on down, we'll move on down to our superintendent report, Dr. Gilbert. Okay, um, the last meeting in June, we brought you a policy board revision for EBCB. We explained to you at that time that that's actually going to be combining policies EB, EBC, and EBCB. Uh, and uh, we would recommend second reading approval of those policies. Second. Yeah, motion is second. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote. All in favor say motion, say aye. 
<laughs> All opposed? All right. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to the next. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to slow us down just a little bit, but um, there's a good bit of information I need to bring you. Um, <clears throat> we spoke with you back in the spring about ESSER 2, and that was around $9 million or so dollars that the district received. That is how we paid for the additional engineers. That's how we closed out a, enough devices for one-to-one. -one. It's how we have been replacing a lot of Promethean boards with panels. Um, it also is how we're paying for the instructional technology uh, the folks. It's also how we're addressing air quality issues. Um, then, we, you know we told you at that time that we were also going to receive ESSER 3, and at that time, we were still not completely clear on how much money that was, but we were able to give a, a good ballpark estimate, which of course um, ended up being true. Okay, which direction do I point to get a second? There we go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> First, let's talk generally about ESSER 3, and uh, please interrupt me if you have questions at the spot, because it might be better if we discuss it at a particular spot. But our adjusted allocation is $21,402,150. All of this money has to be expended by September 30th, 2024, because that is the end of that federal fiscal year. Unlike ESSER 2 and ESSER 1, there is a required set aside for learning loss that is $4,280,000. So, before we even start, we've got to go and mark off and say, this $4 million, $4.2 million, has to be spent directly on learning loss. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about that as we work through. With the learning loss requirements, uh, we will be addressing the summer programs 2022, 23, and 24, just as we did in 21 with an expanded. We also are going to be looking at our school calendar uh, for ways that we can make what is called an intercession. That's time during the year that you can actually, when the majority of your students might be out, you can address students who have needs during the year rather than waiting to the end of the year and trying to catch them up. Also with that, we can uh, do academic enrichment. For instance, we can do arts enrichment during that time, and we can do other types of enrichment, which of course uh, figure into the learning loss. So we are building, have tentatively built that into the plan. You heard the mention of the added reading recovery teacher. This is directly at our lowest performing readers. And uh, this will be the, the teacher leader who would start uh, next school year. And then we would be able to pay for two school years with that. Then of course, the funding for the interventionists that were hired under ESSER 2. We told you in the spring we would it would not be a one-year deal, it would actually be a three-year deal, so that's how we're funding that. <clears throat> and then we would target uh, adding nine more reading and math interventionists, this time probably more on the math side, um, and hopefully with a longer lead time, knowing that we need to hire these folks, we can recruit and then backfill where we need to. Then also, one of the things that we're required to do is track the uh, data for ESL students. And that is best accomplished through our normal software, actually where we do uh, 504 students and IEP students. So we have to uh, add on that data tracking module there. And so we're able to purchase that through the ESSER funds. <clears throat> the other thing under this is updating our volumes in our, in our libraries. Also, our classroom libraries, media centers, and student supplemental engagement programs. So we can address those things that we need to within the media centers. Also under the 20% requirement, uh, art and music fall, fall there. And in fact, we're strongly encouraged to add funding to art and music. And the reason for that is art and music uh, programs have a direct correlation on student academic achievement. So we are encouraged to spend more money in those areas and we will be setting aside funds for that out of the 20%. Also, the, the materials that are needed to do this remediation for the K-8 will put into there. 
The next one is we will expand our mental health services. You're aware that we already have mental health servicing uh, to all of our schools on part-time basis. We would actually expand the amount of mental health care that's available. That's a high priority for the ESSER funds. We could either put it under learning loss or depending on how the dollars fit, we can also put it under activity nine that I'll mention uh, shortly. And then finally, we, we have a lot of stuff that we have to pay for. Uh, summer school has to be paid for. We're having folks who are having to teach during their planning periods because they're teaching virtually and face-to-face. -face. We have to pay for dual modality te teaching. You may remember in the fall, General Assembly said we had to pay teachers a supplement for doing dual modality moving forward. And then after school programs and um, basically all of that extra time has to be paid for. You're probably aware that we had to supplement summer school uh, uh, pay this year. We did it through a stipend, a daily stipend for teachers. Um, we in the past have been paying, just in the past we've been paying a whopping uh, $25 uh, an hour for uh, summer school and stuff like that. And that number actually crept up to almost $50 an hour after the stipend. And that was what the other districts around us and across the state and across actually the nation had gone to. We chose to go to a stipend. That way when the ESSER money runs out, we'll have to figure out where we land back because we can't afford to do that much ongoing. One of the things that we had to do was actually survey uh, and hold focus groups. And so you probably saw the, the information about the survey that went out. We actually had over 1,300 respondents. And um, we, we were very pleased with that. When we started out, I was like, if we get 500 respond, we'll do really good. We got 500 over the first night. So uh, we ended up with 1,300 respondents. You'll notice that included community members, parents and guardians, students, teachers, school administrators, school staff, district staff, professional organizations, and other stakeholders. Um, and you can see from the bar graph there how those you know, are, are sort of chosen as far as what category they fall within. We also held a focus group um, that uh, had community leaders, teacher of the year, different representatives um, to actually review this information. And basically what the goal is, is to make sure that what community and educators align on where we're spending the money. On the, the, this graph on the screen up there, the largest area, the bar that's the tallest, is technology. <coughs> and we, we identified that inside as being the area that was most needed for us to continue to support with ESSER three funds. And you'll notice that that also was, was, came out um, of, of the, the, the survey. <coughs> Quite honestly, the survey results mirrored quite closely what we were doing in ESSER 2. So you'll notice that our priorities in ESSER 2 feel very much like our priorities in ESSER 3. Okay. The first area, and if you remember, we used to call them buckets in ESSER 2. They referred to funding buckets. Now it's areas and there are 15 different areas we're going to talk about the ones that, that we are taking a look at uh, in our financial plan with ESSER and uh, first one is activities that are covered under the elementary secondary act uh, special needs act and the Perkins act and you'll notice that what we're looking at is necessary uh, CTE program changes IDEA assistance for special needs students however I would add that we are on board to get another large chunk of funding directly for IDEA covered students, special needs. We are estimating, we do not have that allocation yet, we're estimating that's gonna be north of 400,000 additional dollars that are going to go to uh, our funding for special needs students. So we may spend a smaller amount here. Also with adult education, one of the things that we have to address are, are ESL students and some of this funding is, has to be set aside for that.
And then we have the um, addressing needs of unique students, and I just mentioned ESL, so we would look at the addition of up to two ESL teachers in the county. You'll know that we have over doubled our ESL staff in the past few years because of our increase in, in student enrollment of ESL students. We do meet the defined minimum program right now. However, we, we really need to, to stay in front of that. So we do have to use some of this money for that. The other thing that we used to get was money for migrant and homeless uh, population students. And that had dwindled away over the past five, six years. And so that is another area that we have to set aside money is for migrant and homeless populations, which shockingly, you know, a lot of people say, do we really have homeless kids? We actually have quite a large population of homeless students in our county. What about migrants? Migrant, we actually have very few because most of our migrants are not, re they do not resident. They come through during the school year through the, during through the summer and then move on. The other thing that we have to do is improve preparedness and response. And one of the things that we've looked at is how do we uh, have a safety officer, operations manager, or how do we shift those duties to someone and then use these funds to pay for that uh, for the next few years. So um, that, that is one of the requirements, though, is that we have to improve our preparedness and response, not just for COVID-like activities, but for all natural disasters. The other thing that we have to show that we can do is to train and provide professional development in areas of sanitation for folks like our custodians. We've actually already started a certification program for our custodians. A number of our custodians have already done the online portion of that, and now we'll be doing the hands-on portion of that. And we will be looking at a stipend for those who, well, actually that'll be on the next, I guess, but we, we actually will be looking at a stipend for those folks who actually achieve the certification levels for sanitation of our facilities. The other thing that we're looking at doing, you know a lot of our custodians are 240, which is 12 months. Then we have ones that are only 200 days and ones that are 180 days. We are looking at using these funds to offer extended days to all custodians, which of course ups their pay significantly, which makes us more competitive in hiring custodians and retaining them. So we will be uh, using funds to do that. But that's only for three years. That is only for three years. So it has to be a supplement. Yes, sir. Then obviously the state was sending us supplies last year and they were sending them literally by the, the tractor trailer load. And now, they, now that they say we've got money in our pocket, we have to pay for our own supplies. Just the tablets used to do the uh, misting sanitation are quite expensive, so we have to stock up on those. And um, not only that, but you know we've got to take that, that burden off of the general fund because we could eat up a lot of money really, really quick on custodial supplies. Also supply carts with uh, more custodians working more hours, more days. We've got to have more equipment for them. Vacuums, scrubbers, floor strippers, carpet extractors. And the idea is, is that you go ahead and buy equipment to take you for the long haul. You don't buy stuff that's just going to last you for two or three years. You buy the quality floor stripper that will last you for eight to ten years. And so that we try to pad what we're having to pay for out of the general fund going forward. You'll notice that's a theme of ours is that we're trying to make long-term impact. We also have to supply PPE to, um, to, to different staff members, so we have to do that. For instance, those folks who sanitize the buses, uh, we provide them with the disposable coveralls and all the garb to, to put on before they do the sanitation of the buses. So we have to provide all of that. The other one, ladders, when you see a question mark, you might go, well, why do we need ladders? And the reason you need ladders is because there's a lot of things like grates on HVAC that can be reached if they're on a small ladder by custodians that can be cleaned, which are areas that grab grime that need to be cleaned on a regular basis. So that is actually a big expense in a school district is keeping enough ladders. So we uh, have built those in. Then we also, the planning and coordinating and implementing school closures, um, that, that's where all the, the technology side really comes in is how would you operate if you had to shut down for long term again? So. 
we would maintain those um, technology specialists from ESSER II, but we would also add four more of those technology specialists who could help train our teachers. These next three years are going to be critical in training teachers to use the technology so that we don't just have kids carrying a Chromebook around. They've got to actually use the Chromebook. And then we got to sustain the network engineers, and then we would look to add two more contracted engineers for the 22-23 year. <clears throat> and then we would also have to continue the contract for cybersecurity and endpoint monitoring. I think, Dr. Hale, I saw a, a back and forth today that we are over like 13, 1,400 devices in the district. That's 13 or 1,400 points where we can be infected by, by you know, spam, spyware, those kinds of things. And we have to actually uh, endpoint monitor every single device within the district. So um, that is a sizable expense annually that, that we have to add. 13,000, excuse me, 13,000 uh, uh, devices, sorry. Drop in zeros. The next thing that we are looking at, I'm sorry, I'm getting off here, is this would be one year premature, but because we can use these funds to refresh our devices, typically you work on a four year cycle for devices. Well, we could, in the fall of 2024, go ahead and buy devices to, re to refresh all of these we just bought. I don't want you to, to swallow too hard when I say this. We're looking at a five to $6 million expense to refresh these devices that only have a four-year lifespan. So you can imagine that if we can get ahead on one refresh cycle, we need to use our money to do that. So again, that makes long-term impact. Also, the uh, protective storage uh, for devices, racks, carts. You know, when you have these devices at school, you need a way to be able to charge them. Kids invariably come to class, pull out their device, and it's not charged. You've got to be able to give them power somehow. We will be buying a limited number of desktops moving forward. But that number is going to be much more limited than it's been in the past because, for instance, all the teacher desktops now fade away because they all have the Chromebook. Not only do they have the Chromebook, but now they've got a panel, like this one over here, that actually has another computer on the back of it. So the classroom teacher actually has two computers now that are signed out to them. So we will phase out. But there are certain areas we have to maintain desktops. For instance, a lot of CTE areas require Windows-based machines. And so we will use Windows-based machines there. Our finance office requires Windows-based machines. So we have places where we have to have a Windows-based machine that we'll have to continue that. And then finally, the panels. We, uh, we will continue the replacement and refresh of all the panels. All of the Promethean boards will come out of our building and all of our teachers will have the panels. Now we've been buying those panels over four years. So we actually have some, as crazy as it is, we have some that are starting to age out now. So we're not only buying the new ones for the teachers, we're buying those that are for the folks who had one that's already aging out. So those earliest ones we bought are at end of life now. We talked about bucket number nine in mental health services, or not bucket area number nine. Uh, we, we mentioned that that could fall under learning loss. We will continue to contract mental health services, but we are also planning to, uh, to actually bring on board a full-time mental health counselor who is a, a employee of the school district. The reason we're going to do that is because that person then becomes someone who can help us coordinate the mental health services program across the county. And we will add those counselors for the life of ESSER 3. Now, the great thing about mental health counselors, if they can build a caseload and can build Medicaid billing, we can potentially maintain those positions because they actually pay for themselves. You will recall that all of our mental health counselors across the district right now only cost us about sixty or $65,000 total because of the amount of Medicaid money we generate. 
So we only have to supplement that a small amount. School facilities will continue to pull the carpet out and go carpet to tile where possible. There are some areas like band rooms where we do have to go carpet to carpet. Media centers, we have to go carpet to carpet. But where we can get uh, back to tile, uh, we are using the uh, LVT tile, which allows us to not have to wax anymore. It's only a, a uh, scrubber machine during the summer, scrub the room out, move on to the next room. So not only does it give us a 30-year durable floor that is warranted for 15 years, I think, I'm looking at Mr. Batson, because we really were concerned about the warranty on something that is fairly new in public schools, but, um, but we, you know, we save money later on labor and on uh, stripping and waxing supplies. If you haven't seen those rooms, uh, I encourage you to swing by a school and take a look at some of those rooms. Uh, Mr. Bass, how many rooms did we complete this year? And as crazy as it is, we actually have to have a building permit in order to change the floor. Uh, that includes a demolition plan, a life safety plan, and a construction plan. So we actually have to pay engineers to do, uh, design professionals, to do stamped drawings that we have to submit. Um, that might have been the design professional's lobby that was able to put that in. We have to do the same thing with HVAC. Uh, we actually have to have a Unless we put in exactly the same model number unit that we're taking out, we have to actually have design prints done for any HVAC units that we change out. Which is interesting because who would replace a 30-year unit with a unit that was a model year 30 years ago? Uh, and obviously we're going to higher SEER ratings because we're going to save energy off of these swaps also. But. Um, multiple million dollars in ESSER II uh, being uh, devoted to HVAC change outs, and so we're there. Also, we'll continue to look at roof replacement in areas of our greatest need. Uh, you probably know, with the exception of this building, a piece of Chesterfield High School and a piece of Sherrall Primary School, we, uh, we have roofs now that are approaching 30 years in age, so they're aging out. So we have significant expenditures uh, that we'll be making on roofs out of this money. For, for, uh, in terms of school remodeling, replacement, and what have you, and in terms of our HBA system, what, what would we be? 50% of the line, or 20, what? 15 to 20% when the project's over. 15 to 20%? Yeah, 15 to 20%. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the capital needs also. So we, we really, we're making a dent, but the dent is very small. Okay. Now, flooring we're doing a very good job on, but uh, between roof and HVAC as far as the cost, 20% is a good number to say we're going to be able to address in total cost. What we have to remember is that in the early 2000s, our school district embarked on a referendum that built a lot of schools and renovated a lot of schools. We are at end of life for a lot of that equipment that was put into place. And it's not the way we like to do things. You know that since I've come, we've tried to do things in cycles, like buses. We try to buy a bus along and along so that we don't have to have a big expenditure. But this situation, them dumping this much money in our lap, we've got to use what we can to, to do it. The other thing that we have is the Palmetto uh, Center uh, second floor renovation. Uh, there's a couple of issues with uh, the second floor of this building on that end. You probably know that building was not, they did not complete the work in there. All they did was put the sprinklers in and, and walked away. Well, now we have an air quality issue that has come up out of that. We did have a roofing issue that was solved a number of years ago. But not only that, but we've brought in all of these other technicians. We've brought in all, you know, we brought in seven, 8,000 additional devices that we're bringing in and out of the building servicing and all. And quite honestly, 
Dr. Hale now has taken over the other conference room at the end of the hall, and we've blocked it off into areas for, for people to work. But quite honestly, we don't have space to support this one-to-one -one initiative that we've put into place. We don't have the square footage. Now, that doesn't mean that we would put technology folks upstairs because we don't want them having to go up and down the elevator with, with, with uh, technology devices. But that's real cheap floor space, very, very cheap floor space because it's tile floor, ceiling, hang the HVAC units. So in the big picture, it's very cheap uh, uh, square footage to gain in the district. So we will be looking at that as a way to address that. The next thing is HVAC, which we've already spoken about. We, uh, we, we actually are just starting the ESSER two projects on HVAC. We, uh, we're turning in, we've got the engineers working on the plans for those, um, and we will be doing those, and again, we'll go to the, higher, the highest SEER units that we can put into place. But um, we are targeting units first that are 20 years of age and older, and then, of course, we back down in the years of age uh, from 20. Um, it's pretty shocking, though, what that list looked like in 20 years. Uh, it's it's kind of scary. And then air purification. We are uh, looking at installing air purification, whether it be the device that just sits in the room or whether it be the device that sits in the return unit of the room. There's some good things about the one up in the, in the ceiling in the return unit is that it's out of the way and nobody's touching it, banging on it and all. But the other thing is it's up there and nobody checks it. Where if it's the in-room style uh, purification, ionization unit, you know, then somebody knows that there's a problem with it and we can address the problem. That will actually be a rather quick, whichever route we end up going out of the specs, that'll actually be a very quick project. Uh, that there's a very quick turnaround on doing either one of those. Then finally, for this period of ESSER, we're looking at redefining the role of the lead nurse and probably having the lead nurse be uh, a standalone FTE. Right now it's shared with Ruby Elementary. Reason we would do that is number one, um, every time you hear that we had a isolated student, quarantine student, there is a amount of work that has to be done to report that properly to the state and to document that. Not only that, but there are all the judgment calls, who has to be, who does it has to be, have to be quarantined, those kinds of things. But not only that, but I mentioned earlier our Medicaid billing. The way we support our nursing program is through Medicaid billing. I'll give you a for instance. A child comes into the health room and needs their temperature taken. Now the nurse doesn't know if that child is Medicaid eligible or not. They just know that the child needs their temperature taken. They log in because they keep an electronic log of everything that's done, and they say that you know, such and such needed their temperature taken. They take the temperature, they report what the results were, they do that. If that child is Medicaid eligible, it bills Medicaid. And we actually receive funds that help us support our nursing program. You can imagine the, the, the work that is involved in claiming that money. So we are looking at having the lead nurse take a lead role in that process also. So. Uh, that is how we actually funded the high school um, nurses two years ago when we placed the nurses at the high school was through Medicaid funding. And then other things, this is the what they call the 15th bucket and um, or activity, and this is to sustain the HR side and the finances side of this stuff. You can only imagine, if I mentioned that we have to do building permits on every project that we do and all that. Well, not only that, but all of these people we've hired, every one of those has to be verified monthly what portion of their days were spent doing the federal portion of their job. And we have to certify all that, and all of that will be monitored and audited, so we have to keep up with that. Also, there are indirect costs to all programs, for instance, our maintenance department is working hard with all these renovations and all of that, so we can actually charge to the grant indirect cost for the extra workload that our folks are, are taking on. And then other things that we might want to uh, take a look at on here, 
Uh, we could put the nurse here or we could put it on the other. Also, I mentioned the sanif uh, sanitation certification credentials. We could give that stipend. And then also we could put the extended day for custodians. And that's 21 to $22 million when you talk about all of those things. So uh, over between now and September 2024. Any questions about ESSER 3? If not, uh, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the big concerns that we've always had is that we didn't have enough money to do the things that we wanted to do in the district. Now we've got S3, S2, and then one. So how will this affect our children in the district? Uh, and let me just give an example. Um, let's say that 60% of our kids are not meeting the expectations. Whenever we get all of this in place, is there a projected goal into how it's going to, are we saying at the end of the goal, I mean at the end of this, uh, goal one is that 20% of our students will now, 20% more or 30% more, whatever the case is. Are we looking at the kind through, of the end of it? Through, through our state academic recovery plan, uh -huh. we have to set certain benchmarks and mm -hmm. It would be entirely off my hip to tell you, you know, what but those, we kind have of benchmarks set those are. kinds of benchmarks. But yes, uh, Ms. Folsom and her department had to actually develop what is called an academic recovery plan. That is contingent on us receiving these funds. Of course, that plan was approved uh, rather quickly, but, uh, but there are certain benchmarks that are measured. Of course, we've mentioned many times, a lot of people think about reading and literacy and as the data has come in, math has also been just brutalized in the student performance in this process. So uh, we, we do have to, to keep up with the academic recovery. So, so we do have a benchmark? Yes, sir, we do. That's going to be shared with us? Yes. In fact, I'm sitting here thinking that would be a very good thing for us to do at our September work session, if, if y'all are interested in that, to go over how that's laid out. We should have a whole lot of money in there. Yes, sir. You mentioned the indirect cost. Or with that kind of money, you, is there a percentage of how much of that we can charge back in terms of what you just spoke on? Yes, sir. There are set indirect percentages. Um, again, I need Mr. Willard here to give you those percentages. We never claim the full amount of indirect cost, for instance, for food service. We always claim a rate less than the total allowed. Um, and the reason we do that is, is twofold. Number one, we, we don't want to become dependent on that general fund wise because it's going to go away. And number two, we also, that takes money away from the other activities that we're trying to pay for. Okay. okay. We'll move on to capital bonds update, which these two really tie together. Um, just click, that you combine them? Okay. There have been some questions um, that have come up since the county council has passed their resolution for a uh, referendum on a sales tax. I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but first I want to give you some positive bonding news. It's always nice to give positive news when it comes to bonding and where we are. Uh, this year, when you approve the resolutions in uh, June for our annual SCAGO borrowing program, one of the things that you uh, approved was for us to go through SCAGO to do a taxable bond, which we do a taxable and a non-taxable every year. As it worked out because of the bond market this year, there are only a few districts that are going out for taxable bonds. So SCAGO decided not to pool those. So we're having to go out on a geo bond by ourselves. Great thing about it, though, is we started looking at it. We knew that we were, this trend was probably going to continue for a few years. So we were looking out all the way to 2023, how we structure this. And the great thing about this is when we started taking a look, our bonding council then started taking a look and said, hang on, you've got a, an opportunity to save some money here by doing this a little different way without even having to do a new resolution because of where your, your limits were. So what will happen is 
we will actually issue small geo bonds. That's those, those are done through bank bonds where we get banks to bid on the, the bond sale. We do that every year on some other things, but we'll do those outside of Skago to meet the needs through 2023, which is three years. We're still under our not to, exceed, not to exceed $3 million resolution. So we don't have to do a new resolution. We just have to, you know, I just wanted you to know that this is an opportunity for you to save um, entrance and issuance costs. In fact, we're only going to need to issue these bonds in September or October. And then you'll notice the next line is we're actually going to pay them back in March. And that's because of the way we've been able to structure our tax receipts. We're actually going to be able to save all of that interest that we would have had it over a full year. We're going to compress it all the way to March. Not only that, but instead of annual issuance cost each year having to pay to close the bond and do all that, we're going to do it one time. So it, it results in a significant savings. Now, overall, this is only $300,000 worth of bonds. But, you know, anything that you save on $300,000 in bonds is certainly worth it. So um, that, that was some good news that came out of it. Again, board action is not required, but I do like to make you aware because um, those folks do keep an eye on the bottom line for us, and you all know over time we've refunded a number of bonds and have saved significant money. Which brings me to the next slide. You've seen these numbers uh, because we don't have the numbers for ending this year uh, that ended June 2021 yet. Just to give you an idea at the clip we're paying off our debt, we uh, in June of 2013, we were still uh, $101 million uh, from principal and interest total outstanding bonds. As of September of 2020, that number had dropped to 53, $55,370,000, and it will make another significant drop this year. So you can see that, that we are starting to close in on the amount of, of money that we owe. All right, now this is the chart. I've shown you all this chart before, and this one makes everybody's head dizzy, but that's okay. We don't need to be dizzy over it. What this shows you, if you can see it, is that from 14 to present, our payments were supposed to incrementally go up. You notice that those bars rose. And remember, when I first came, one of the things we talked about was the significant rise we were going to see in millage rates over the next few years because that was going to go up. But because of the refundings that we've done, we've been able to flatten that and keep that millage rate um, after we added the technology bond and the transportation bond, it took it to 34.75. You'll notice that it dances around the 34.7 number all along all the way out until 2032. Now, one of the things I want you to look at on here significantly that's important is what happens to our bond payments between 25 and 26. And they go from north of 7 million to north of 4 million. But you also know what happens during that same period of time. School district's sales tax rolls off the books. So that's what we're going to talk a few minutes about. I've got to give you a history lesson because I had to have our bond attorney give me a history lesson. Some of you who've been around know that in 2000, there was a Bond Property Tax Relief Act that was passed, and that was done through local legislation. But local legislation shortly after that was made illegal when it came to local sales taxes. So when you have heard the county talk about the way our school district did the sales tax and borrowed the money is no longer legal, that is in fact the case. However, as laws do, laws have evolved, so we'll talk some about what has happened. So we'll not be able to reauthorize under this act. In 2006, Horry County, the county, and Horry County School District both put a question on the ballot, a referendum question, to add a local sales tax. Both of them passed. 
The only problem is the act that those were, were passed under said that only one or the other could have a local sales tax. So either the county could have it or the school district could have it. But both could not have it. So instead of just throwing out both, the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court decided they would make a decision on who got the money. So as I understand it, they took the bond, the, the referendum that got the most votes. They said gets it. The other one does it. The county's referendum got more votes than the school district. So the school district was left out in the cold. But obviously, they both couldn't have it, so we did this. But the school district says, whoa, we've still got significant needs, and we don't have a way to meet those needs. So as happens, legislators were lobbied, and in 2008, 4-10-410 was passed. And this was the Education Capital Improvement Sales and Use Tax Act. And if I don't say that the whole time, y'all just know that, that I'm going to do it one time. But, but what that said was, was now a school district can go out and get their own capital tax, even if the county has one. However, you needed to add a little complication caveat which said that the only school districts that could do this was a school district that got at least $7 million a year in accommodations tax. Well, guess how many counties in the state at that time got $7 million in accommodations tax? At that time, Horry County. Horry County lobbied for the bill. They wanted to be the only one to get benefit of the bill. Of course, over a few years, Charleston and Buford County both reached that $7 million plateau. So they were the only districts who could have a district tax and a county tax. Well, that doesn't seem fair. So in 2014, more lobbying went on with legislators, and that provision was amended to say any school district that had previously passed a local sales tax would be grandfathered in and could ask for reissuance of the sales tax under the new education capital tax. So that makes Chesterfield County eligible. So since we were eligible, are eligible for the tax, it means that both the county and the school district can have a sales tax if the voters approve. Now, two differences that I want to point out while we're here, and I'm going to point them out again. The School District Act, the Education Capital Act, the referendum can only occur in a general election on an even-numbered year. So 22, 24. The act that the county can do their tax under just has to be a general election as defined by the Tuesday after the first Monday in the month of November, so they can place theirs on in even or odd years. So that's what they're doing. They're placing theirs on the ballot for Election Day 2021. Now, we all know there are no other offices open on Election Day 2021, so that will be the ballot. Now... There also is no restriction on how far in advance you ask the voters. So they are saying in theirs that they want to put this tax on in 2025 when the school district tax goes off. They are allowed to do that as far in advance as they wish, just as the school district could do it as far as they wish. Because the legislation is silent. There's nothing that says they can or they can't. Therefore, they can't. So, if the school district wants to consider a education capital improvements tax, our bond council recommends that that question be placed on the ballot in 2024 general election and that it then be set to roll on to the books August 2025 when the current tax rolls off. 
they obviously they do counseling all over the state for this. They don't see advantages in trying to go early. They feel that because if you go too early, you can't predict interest rates at the time. You can't predict project calls. It's more difficult to do those kinds of things. They say the closer to the actual time they feel is the better. Some key considerations. If the board at that time decides they want to pursue this, the tax can only be implemented now for 15 years as opposed to the previous 25 years. Now, the county's tax, I think, can still go 25. I know it can go 20, but I think it can go 25. But the one for education entities can only go 15. Told you the referendum has to be on an even number of year. Both can have the penny, and the referendum question must list specific projects. So you've got to tell what you're going to use the money for in advance. You can't see if it passes and then decide what you'll spend the money on. All right. Now, part of the 2000 bond referendum was a portion of proceeds that go toward what's called annual maintenance. And there is money set aside both out of the sales tax as well as out of the um, millage that pays for our ongoing capital projects. Now that number has been as low as 300000 a year since I've been here. It's been as high some years as a million dollars. And it fluctuates depending on that graph that we saw earlier on what the proceeds are and what's available. Things that that's been used for recently. Playground upgrades. HVAC, that's how we've been buying the units we've been buying all along to keep up. Roofing, painting, we've painted all the schools in the county. Paving, what little bit we've done. The lighting retrofits, LED, changing those. Baseball, softball upgrades to get our Title IX compliance and our ADA compliance. Also, on the next list, technology equipment. You do know that you approve $750,000 every year for technology, or every three years, excuse me. Tammy over there was having a stroke. She thought she had more to spend. <laughs> but So that's $250,000 a year. As we've already talked about, that is a drop in the bucket. So we spend additional annual maintenance money on technology needs. Safety lock upgrades. We, we're finishing the, the access control at all of the schools. Media center volumes. We've bought media center books twice since I've been here. Band uniforms, music and art equipment, custodial equipment. And this is just a partial list, but that's the kind of things that get bought through the annual maintenance. So, this current sales tax, of which that annual maintenance is a part of, runs out in 2025. The current revenue from the sales tax, this is a conservative estimate, but we've been averaging about $3.5 million a year is what the sales tax brings in. There are years it does really good. There are years it does not so good. There, there, it, it really goes up and down, obviously, with the economy. It's got to be used to pay for bond installments for debt outlined in the referendum. Part of that, remember, was annual maintenance, but part of that, the big chunk of that, are the new schools and the renovations that were done. Here's where we start getting concerned. Is we've got a current debt structure that requires a payment of $4.5 million in 2026. And we don't generate $4.5 million off millage. So if it's not reinstated, you, meaning the board, by law, has to set millage at enough to pay your debt. So that's a concern of ours. Also, you got to remember, if you go back to that chart, we owe money all the way out to 2036. So there, are, there's money owed way out into the future. Now, we're projecting that, that millage will go down some of those years, but you have to keep in mind you've got long-term debt that has to be addressed. So let's put this into perspective so you can really see how this impacts. Here's the impact of just one project. 
one-to-one -one technology. Now, I told you we're going to build into ESSER 2, or ESSER 3, to refresh in 2024. But you got 2028 out there looming already. And you've got to already start thinking about how do we pay for the 28, 2028 refresh. That will include student and teacher devices, including panels. There will be more panels that time than in 2024 because of where the age cycle is. My example, will use present day dollars. So we're going to estimate that the cost refresh is $6 million, conservative estimate. So that's, that's what it cost. So we're going to finance that over a four-year period because that's the life cycle. We wouldn't want to finance over five years because those devices would be gone and we'd still be paying for them. So we're going to pay for them over four years. So the annual cost is $1.5 million. Okay. Presently, our bond council says to use $116,500 as a conservative debt service mill value. So remember, debt service mill is worth more than operational mill, so 116.5 is what they are projecting. So just to pay for the technology refresh, it'll cost 12.87 mills per year for four years. Keep in mind, that's when we're still at 34.7 mills so you've got to add that on top. So that is the importance of taking a hard look at the sales tax and consider it. Because not only is this one item here, remember all of those other items that we fund annually, including the annual maintenance bond that pays for roofs, roof repairs, HVAC, those kinds of things. Now, I would say that if I'm still in the chair, I doubt I will recommend selling a big, big bond all at once because I believe that if you sell smaller bonds over the life of the 15 years, you pay less interest, obviously. You get more money to do projects, plus we address those long-term needs like HVAC and all, but we don't pay for them all. We don't do it all at one time. We space them out over 15 years so that when you have to do it the next time, it's spaced out. It's just a philosophical way of approaching things. So, other future needs, just to, because that question came up. The MACB area classroom additions, probably sooner is sooner rather than later, so maybe not sales tax dependent. The additions related to potential growth issues in Pageland. If you haven't taken a ride around the subdivisions in Pageland lately, you should take a ride because now they're actually saying sold before they even move dirt on the property. The house is already sold. So we, we do have that concern. The ongoing heavy maintenance needs of roofs, HVAC, paving, flooring, lighting, custodial equipment, those don't go away. The other thing that's going to happen is renovations and upgrades to current facilities. Things change in buildings, what you have to do. Also, we do need to address the in in inequities across the district. Some high schools have band and chorus rooms. Some have a band room. Some places we have an art room. Somewhere we've got a, a classroom that we use for art. Elementary music and art is the same way. Not only that, but there are significant athletic facility inequities. We have two schools with a track. One is usable for meets, the other one's not. So we have one track usable for meets in the county. The other two schools don't have even a track. Tennis, we're hit and miss. We do have uh, communities where we have tennis courts that are available, but I'm just using that as an example of something that we don't have currently that we might need to consider that would be possible with the sales tax. That was a long history lesson, wasn't it? Yes. Qu question, what, what's the big difference between the, the Act 388 and the Phoenix Hill tax that we're used to? And when was the last time we used that? Okay. In addition to talking about this Phoenix Hill tax. Okay, 388 is an operational sales tax. Mm -hmm. That one is done by the state, not by the district. Okay. What happens is, is all owner-occupied 
residences, meaning you own the house and you live there, you pay no operational tax to the school district. You only pay debt tax. So that we're not in control of that. So that is a reimbursement. And you notice we always talk about tier three reimbursement each year. When we do budget, we talk about the adjustment three tier, uh, tier three. That's the up and down of that particular 388 tax. Anyone else? Not, not a good one. Just looking at it, if we get to that point where we run out, or when 2025 gets here, if we don't get this renewed, it's going to be a big burden on all the taxpayers because that debt's already in play. That's right. Yes, sir, that debt's already in place. So you will be looking at, 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 at figuring out how you restructure that, and then there will have to be additional millage in order to, to pay the debts that are there. Anyone else? If we're talking about that on the penny sale tax, your recommendation is that we should keep quiet, maybe 23, 24. Um, realistically, uh, talking with uh, Franny Heiser, who's who's with Burr Foreman McNair, she says what we the, the, the preferred route would be to in 23 do an overall needs assessment of the district, uh, complete needs, not only on current debt, future debt, but also projects that need to be done, and then to form that into the referendum question, it would be used in November of 24. Anyone else? That's good. I, I appreciate uh, all the information you've given out. I think that's some real good, valuable information that we've gotten received. So we can take it and uh, try to uh, learn from it, and maybe we'll be prepared for what we're going to have to do at that time. I do thank you for that. All right, this time. Okay, okay. superintendent's report, just for a minute. Um, I sent out to you the. Uh, the information on the protocols for returning and opening school. Um, I guess I'll make my political comment here is that what was the plan? The plan is to open school. And because most of the tools that we had last year at this time were taken away uh, through the legislature and through the governor's um, uh, actions, um, we do have in our pocket five e-learning days that we can use. If we miss more than five days, though, if we have to close the school, say we have to close the school for 10 days because we've had an outbreak, then we could use five e-learning days, but then we also have to make up five days. We, we cannot get waivers to seat time anymore, so that's in place. We also can't move a big group to virtual school because we are capped at 5% on virtual school students or we lose our state funding for each additional student, we go above 5%. And folks, we can't operate giving up uh, state funding for each one of those kids. So we, we, we will cap it at 5%. And we are, we've got a little bit of room if we have IEP students right now, but really we, we've saved a little bit of spot for students for special needs just because that's, you know, we have to be able to accommodate them. Hold but- um, Hold up a minute. Let, let me understand. <clears throat> Last year when we had virtual school, there was almost 64 at the beginning. What you're saying now is that it has to be 95 to 5 percent. Maximum. Maximum. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and what's our number now that we're doing here? We're, we're at 96.4, maybe. About 96.4. That's a lot. Hmm? That's a lot. That's a lot. Yes, sir. Okay. That was the uh, Senator Hembry uh, added that amendment to the budget. I heard of myself, but I didn't hear about that. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the the things that, that we need to be aware of is that um, face masks, you know, are, are optional but are strongly encouraged for students and staff. We do require them of visitors in all facilities. And... Um, they, they are not, you know, dismissed from a, a requirement. Also, face masks for students in healthcare areas, 
for instance, if they go to the nurse's station and there's a concern that you've got a positive case or potential, then everybody has to mask and they can't argue about it. You know, that's just, that's it. Also, you got a student that's got a respiratory issue, mom and dad come pick them up, you walk them from the health center to the front of the school, they are required to wear a mask. And so we, we have those in place. We'll continue to isolate students and staff who have signs and symptoms until we can get them out of the building. We'll sanitize buses and, but, and uh, buildings daily. And we still have to follow the quarantine and isolation procedures per DHEC rules. So um, we, we do still have to follow those. Um, this is not ideal. And I had a teacher talk to me the other day and she said, you know, all year last year, y'all would tell us this is the plan. This is how we're gonna do it, it's gonna be okay. And she said, I haven't heard you say that anywhere I've been this year. And I said, and the reason I haven't said it is because I don't lie to people. There is no plan beyond what I've just shared with you. And there is no contentment. And we hope it goes well. So that's, that's where we are. We are doing the common sense things. We're covering all the water fountains. We're wiping the stuff down. We're doing all the common sense things. But the real tools we had in our pocket if this thing really heats up and continues to heat up, like A-B scheduling and uh, minimized ridership on buses, all that, all that's gone. All those tools are gone. And quite honestly, I think when the legislature did this, they were in a July frame of mind. They were looking at the numbers in July, June and July, and they were saying, everything's fine, it's gonna be okay, this is over. And so without thinking that this might happen that we're dealing with, they went ahead and passed those. So we're very, very restricted in what we have available. Now, you know, quite honestly, I, I'm, you know, athletics is operating on the hope and prayer model also. We got our guidance from the high school league last Thursday, and basically is, it is, we, Y'all's regions need to get together and figure out what's going to happen if you can't play all your games and who's going to make the playoffs. And you got to turn it in. And that's the guidance. So we're, we're really in sort of uncharted territory because we had been very offensive in our approach to things, and now we have taken a completely, and I don't even call it defensive standpoint, I call it a prevent defense that we're just going to, stand back on the goal line and hope nobody crosses. Are you aware of any athletic practice that have experienced COVID so far? Uh, in district? In, not, not here, but in, in the oh, other district. In state, there are already multiple high school football programs that are shut down for an extended period of time. Uh, I noticed one high school in uh, Horry County has already canceled their opening game. So I noticed that Aiken County has canceled uh, their jamboree, their county jamboree because of COVID, and uh, yes, sir, it's, it's, uh, it, and, and it's, it's just going to happen. We haven't had any here. Oh, uh, we've had a few student isolations, but nothing, nothing would, that I would call a big outbreak. Do we have uh, an idea what's the current status of our faculty and staff that has received the uh, vaccine? Yes, sir, we are, we are in the neighborhood. The last time we surveyed, we were in the neighborhood of a 60% staff vaccination rate uh, total. Um, you know, the good thing about them being vaccinated is they don't have to quarantine, which is huge for us at this point operation. But, <clears throat> I definitely understand with the legislative and the state law having the 95 to 5. But if the situation changes and software and hardware have delayed it, we already, if necessary, transition into a uh, hybrid situation if the legislature and the state uh, see that the uh, corona situation continues to spread more and more. Yes, sir, but don't hold your breath for that to happen. But yes, sir, we are prepared, but there is no uh, intestinal fortitude to, to even consider that at this point. Wow. And, you know, mind you, y'all know how involved I am in the state association. We've been working it as hard as we can. 
And even our friends don't have the guts to, to go that route. Dr. Goodwin. By uh, this time, we'll go under the chairman comments. Uh, our next meeting will be September 13th here at Palmetto Learning Center at 5 30. The second session will start at 5. And uh, our September 27th will be our board workshop uh, session. It'll be also here at Palmetto Learning Center at 5. And if no more business is here, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Got a, motion. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor say motion. Saying aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Appreciate your attendance. You know.